way that you come from Zimbabwe. I want you to walk us through your upbringing. Okay, well, it starts with my mother, who was a very, she was a doctor child, very, very spoiled, um, only child, um, married the boy next door, went up to, to Zimbabwe to make the fortune for the in the old days, had me, had my brother, had the most perfect life, beautiful house, everything. So my father got sick and died like that. And that's what we, uh, I saw my mother going through, not only her grief, but got, being flung into a world where she couldn't cope. And that's why I work with women empowerment every single day of my life. I empower women to know that if something like that happens to them, they can do it on their own. And my mother got a job at um, Lillian and Lester in Durban, on the Daily Road, for 30 grand a month as an invoice typist. And that's what we had to live on. So I was put into a foster home in Lutheran for the Marysburg. My little brother went down and eventually she got me back. We lived in the back room of a, of a relative's house. So when people say, you have to come from money, I come from nowhere. The next year, my mother married my stepfather, and he was earning 50 rand a month. But the difference was that he came with three teenage children, and by that time, we were two teenagers. So we were five teenage children and two adults living on 50 rand a month. So even in those days, when I tell you it was tight, it was very tight. I had my first ever, first ever taste of Coke when I was 18. I had my first packet of chips when I was 20. I did, we didn't have things that normal people have. So um, it was just the most amazing thing. But it taught me to, to cope. And I started work at 12 years old in a hairdressing salon in, in Oroby Road, Queen Mary's, with washing hair. And I didn't know how to wash hair. We were poor whites. We washed with, with our hair with sun like soap. So I just had to watch the others and see what they did. And that stood me in good stead because whenever I've had to do something that I didn't know, I watched what other people did and just copied them. And nine times out of ten, you get it right. Yeah. And then um, your education. Um, where, did you school in Zimbabwe? Or that's no, when I came, came down and I uh, finished. And funny enough, it's my 50 year reunion of writing the trick this year. Can you believe it? 50 years <laughs> So, um, I, I, I'm actually hosting the, the trick for my Mitchell Girls High in Durban, which is where I grew up, and then Russell Girls High, where I finished. And just to give you an idea what it was like in those days, in my matric class, we were 12 girls. Eight got married the first year out of school. I got engaged the first year out of school, and when the, the wedding was coming up, I got cold feet so I went overseas, which was the best thing I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came back. When I was 25, I married my husband. Um, who was 24 years old and could neither read nor write. He'd been right through the South African education system and couldn't read and write at the end of it. And so his father said to him, look, you're never going to get your matric. He was 18 and 77. Um, why don't you just get a job where you can work with your hands? So he did. And that's, uh, that was something that I did. When I had to get a job, when I was sitting in Chapel Street Baptist Church looking down at my shoes, and I was the only child at 12 years old in my school shoes, I knew I had to get, and my people were poor, they had no money to buy me shoes. That's why I got a job washing hair in a hairdressing salon for 50 cents a Saturday morning, and in seven weeks I could buy that pair of shoes. And I, I valued them, and to this day I say, tell people, they come to me and they say, give me this, give me that. I'm not giving you anything, because if you don't earn it, you don't value it. You've got to earn it to value it, and then you do, and that's what, that was a lesson that taught me in those days. Okay, and then your entrepreneurial bug, where does it come from? Well, you know, it came out of being necessity. When I've been married for five years, I felt pregnant, and I told my boss I was pregnant, and he said to me, two words, you're fired. And so that was the days before TCMA, there was nothing you could do, you took your handbag and went home. Mm -hmm. And there I was pregnant, no job, no nothing. And um, so what did God give me? He gave me my brains and my two hands. And that's all you need in this life, is your brains and your two hands. If you have that, you have everything. So I was a shorthand typist, so I phoned all the men and I typed the letters at night, they fetched them in the morning, and in the morning I would type the letters and they fetched them at night. So that's how I started, 25 cents a sheet. At that stage, it was in the old days, 1976, 77, 78, Alan J. Holmes started Game, Dion Freelander started Dion's, and my husband was working for a boss and he was fixing air conditions and fridges and stoves, and he said to his boss, why don't you start discounting like these other people are? And he said, if you're so clever, go do it yourself. So that's how we went from having no children and two jobs to having two children and no jobs in the space of one year. That is the way to get your entrepreneurship going. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I read so I read on one of the interviews that um, Alan, Alan, so how's yeah. He had around 900 rents when he started um, Hershey's. Yes. How did he then decide to bring you along into the business? And he couldn't get rid of me, I just kept it right. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment also, were you aware of where you wanted the business to be positioned, of where you wanted to see it in future? 
Not at all. I was at home with two babies. I, was, I didn't have my children very young, so I was quite old. I had these two babies. And I always had my first entrepreneur that I ever trained was one day, and those of you who have been at home with two babies, it's not fun. And I was uh, tearing my hair, and there was a knock on the door. And it was actually a, a, a lady standing there looking for directions. And I said to her, come in, you've got the job. She said, no, I'm going for a job, and I'm just looking for directions. I said, no, you've got this job here. You're starting today. <laughs> and she was my first entrepreneur. And she was fantastic, and I taught her to do everything. I love teachers, I taught her, and she, was, she could cook, and she could sew, and she could do everything. People said, you're so lucky to have Florence. I wish I had somebody like Florence. Mm -hmm. So I said to Florence when she went home at Christmas, why don't you bring something back with you? So she brought Esther, and we brought Esther into our home, and we taught her how to do everything, and Esther was fantastic. So when other people came around and said, oh, I wish I had somebody like Florence in my house, mm -hmm. I said, well, here's Esther. So Florence got Esther the job, but she was very really clever. Because Esther had to bring her 10% of her salary for life. So every month, Esther would come and give her 10% of her salary. So when she went home at Christmas time, guess what she did? She was somebody else. And she did that the same. And long story short, when she retired after 30 years with me, she had 26 lots of 10% in salaries coming in, which wow. allowed her to buy a big trading store where she, uh, she lived until she died um, a while ago. So that was my first entrepreneur. And from there I started, I just loved teaching people to make money, and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And I teach people to make money on a daily basis. And I have people coming to me every day and saying, how do I make money? And I just say, it's so easy. It's a very, very easy formula, and if I teach you how, you can do it. And then I just want to talk a little bit about um, education um, and entrepreneurship. Because I know you get involved in a lot of projects where you assist girls um, to, you know, with um, Okay, so. Towers to so that they don't miss, uh, you know. Well, let me just tell you, let me give you some stats, and these are on the current Thinker magazine. 66% of all the work done in the world is done by women. 50% of all the food produced in the world is produced by women. But only 10% of the salaries in the world are earned by women. And only 1% of the land in the world is owned by women. Now, how stupid are we? You have to ask yourself that question. How stupid are we? We're working our butts off, and you are guys that are getting rich. So um, I like to tell you that I broke that mold, and I personally own over a billion rands with a property, and I work hard every day and I earn a lot of money, and I, I broke right out of that mold, so that I, and I want to be a leader with other women, that they will follow me and do what I do, because I know how to do it, and I can teach them how to do it. And I work with women all day, every day, so I can do it. Okay. So in 2012, I went business law in South Africa, and I thought, what am I going to do to leave a legacy? I didn't want to win it, and then I'd go, and nobody would remember me, and I wouldn't have done anything. It would have been a waste of a life. So um, I was so lucky, as part of Business Women South Africa, I had to travel to every town in South Africa and talk to business women. And in a place of PE of all places, I met a wonderful woman called Michelle Brown, and she told me about the Girls with Dignity Project. Because I was 62 at that stage, and I had no idea that in this country, there are 9 million schoolgirls between the ages of 11 and 18, who only go to, uh, of which only 40% go to school for four weeks of the month. 60% of those girls only go to school for three weeks of the month because they've got no sanitary protection. Now the result is in the schools, the girls' marks were between 40 and 60 percent, where the boys' marks were between 60 and 80 percent. So the message being sent out to the girls is that we're more stupid than the boys, which you know is completely wrong. Yeah. And so how did we get this across? So with my friend Sue Barnes, who was with me last night, at the, uh, she won the, that award um, two years ago, and, and congratulations, I was there last night watching you guys win. Um, so she invented reusable sanitary pads because you can't get girls in the in the rural areas disposable ones that no which dispose of them. So you can't do that. So um, we manufacture she's a dress designer by profession actually and she has two daughters. And she thought if my daughters are dyslexic and they had to the school they never pass. So she started making reusable sanitary pads and we give them to the girls and with panties that the pads clip into so they can do sport, they can do whatever they want, they can dance, whatever. And they, when they get home, they just rinse them under a cold tap, wash them up, they wash their bookies, hang them up, and they can use them the next day, the next month, the next year. They last them for five years. So we normally give them out in grade eight, they last them to the trick, and they can go to school every single day. And we've seen marks go from 43% up to 82% within six months. So any questions or if you have um, anything to tweet use our hashtag start JHB and some of you would also still a chance to win some of the prizes that we're going to be giving away tonight and I would like to talk about leadership 
especially when it comes to um, female entrepreneurs. How important is that, especially to entry-level entrepreneurs? Okay, well, you know, I think, first of all, women must stop thinking of people as women. When I go into a boardroom, I'm always the only woman there. And I say, don't think of me as a woman, I'm a man. Think of me as a man, and then you'll treat me like a man, and then you don't have to treat me like a woman. And I've never thought of myself as a woman, because I've always been such a strong person. I've got a very strong husband. You have to be a strong man, so you've got a strong woman. You should know, yeah. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so you've got to be a very strong man to live with a strong Only a weak man will live with a weak woman. Yes. And so you, you're going to have a strong man, but he's going to let you do what you want. You know, men, by virtue of their nature, have been taught by their parents to te tell you what to do. And women are so stupid, they used to listen. But you don't have to do that. And I go out there and I tell women, you, if you want to do something, you go right ahead and do it. You don't ever have to ask for permission from anybody. And I think that's it. And I lead women. I have my own women's group. I have actually lots of women's groups. So I have a women's group that meets once a month in my store. And they're all business owners, and I help them to grow their businesses. And we work together as a collective team, helping each other to grow our businesses, because that's what it's all about. And the networking aspect of it, because I know you, you host um, regular networking, networking breakfasts. So I do ladies' clubs, I do networking breakfasts. I teach domestic workers, and I work with domestic workers. And my, the beauty of my domestic workers is I teach them how to use all the model stuff that their employers buy. But I also have had amazing success with my domestic workers. So now, as your self is Steam grows, so your bank balance grows. I mean, as they start to feel better about themselves, they do better. And so many of my domestic workers have started their own um, agencies. I mean, I have one in Cape Town who now has 30 full time mates, 300 part time mates working for her. She started very small, hiring. We trained the mates in my own house, and then we started hiring them out for a day, a week, a month, whatever. And from there, she, she came to me one day and she said, you know, my business is going well, but I want to take it to the next level. And I said to her, I teach you to fish. I don't give you to fish. Go, you think how you can get it. And she came back. She said, I've got it. And we had bought her a little Skidoff motor car in those days uh, for, for 30000 from the pound. And she got six ladies, and they would go to sleep at 6 o'clock at night. They'd wake up at midnight, and they'd go to the fancy houses in Bishop's Court in Cape Town. Uh, where the madam was now saying goodbye to all her guests at one o'clock in the morning and they'd jump out the car and go and the madam would go to sleep and then they would come in like six little fairies and they'd wash the floors, the toilets, the dishes, the madam would wake up in the morning and the house just becomes bad. And for a big house, she could get up to 10,000 rand for one night. Wow, that is amazing. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, just shout. Um, so, are you going you know, um, you've got to always think of um, um, Stephen Covey teacher, stop with the end in mind. This conversation is going this way. How do I want it to end? And you, you work from the end in mind and you work backwards to now. It actually gives you the steps that you have to take. It's quite hard to get your emotions, especially I'm a very emotional person because I'm very passionate, I'm emotional about everything. And, and I work with people who have broken fridges and stoves and washing machines. You don't want to have a man with a broken television. <laughs> Not much. So I have to be able to cope with them. It was my fault it broke, you know. I mean, she'll come in with a toaster with literally the knife sticking out of it that she's put in to get the toaster and say, I bought this toaster from you, it's broken. What are you going to do about it? And you know, you have to take it. And I think working with people, I love working with people. People energize me. Because uh, when you work with people, that they, you feed off their energy as well. And it's just a matter of turning it around to make it your advantage. And it's a learned art. And I think by networking a lot, you get to understand how people work. Do you know, have you done the five love languages? Have you done it? Okay, those of you who haven't just Googled the five love languages, and you see what pushes people's buttons. And it's easy to see the people who will touch you, the people who will bristle when you say how nice you look, and that sort of thing. So you work on your love languages, and that's the easiest way to get around that situation. And then also when it, when it comes to that, people as well, um, you always pride yourself in having like the best employees within yes. um, hashes. How do you keep uh, your employees happy and how do you make sure that um, they feel welcome, they feel like they're at home? Well, it's a family business, which helps. So we're all family and, and we make them feel like part of our family. I mean, when I go to Cape Town, my staff stay in my flat. When they're German, they stay in my flat as well. So, and here I have uh, several flats where my employees actually stay until they can stabilize. So if they come to me and they have nowhere to live, they've come from Port Friday or wherever. 
Um, I have a flat where they can stay, and then it's like a little commune, it's a three bedroom flat, they live together, and they only allow them to stay there for three months. The first month they've got to save their deposit, the second month their first month's rent, and the third month they like some water. Then they must go and find their own place, and then the next one comes in. So we treat them very, very well. Um, I, I work on their self esteem and their, their growth as well. When they come to me, I mean, some of them get off the bus from Durban and they've got a checkers bag with, you know, two shirts and a pair of shoes in. And I say, in six months you're going to buy a brand new car. They say, oh, no, not me. No. And I say, I promise you, I teach you vision boarding, I teach you goal setting, and in six months you'll get that car. Mm -hmm. And usually in six months, you look at my parking lot, looks like a showroom for BMW. Wow. <laughs> and then for somebody who is outside of Hershey's and wants the same level of mentorship, or guidance from you, how accessible are you when it comes to that? I'm very accessible. You can follow me on Facebook, all of you can follow me on Facebook. And um, every day I put out um, a blog, I yes. put out a motivational video, I put out tweets on Instagram, Instagram I yeah. put a lot of different things. I do a day called blog, I do recipes every single day that come tuning out. And that sometimes you just, especially as an entrepreneur, it's a lonely world. Some people are working from home and they've got no one to chat to. Just go onto that and it just gives you that bit of a oomph. And then I've got lo lovely friends. My friend Anne Wilson is the wealth chef. Anne was an engineer, she worked at Transnet and uh, Maria Ramos, they worked together. And when she was finished in South Africa, she went and worked on the London Underground, fixed that up. She'd come back here and she teaches people to be rich. So Google the wealth chef, Anne Wilson, she's absolutely fantastic. And she'll teach you how to ma make money. You know, like, if I always say to people, if I tell you to make a dress, and you don't know how to make it, you're never going to, if I give you the same machine to trap it, you still won't make it. But tell you how to make money, and you don't know how to make it. You don't know how to get there, but if we teach you how to make money, it's very easy. And making money is easy, but keeping it's a tricky bit. Okay, so that's what we teach you to do as well. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, what are some of the challenges that you face along the way? Because I mean, somebody might look at you today and think, oh, she has made it. It must have been easy for her because of this and that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you have to deal with along your journey? And what did you have also have to leave behind for you to become the package, what you are today? So I think in anybody's life, you're going along, we were going along swimmingly. I mean, we've been in business for 10 years. Our business was fantastic. I bought the house of my dreams. I had the address that I wanted. My house was paid for. My cars were paid for. Everything was going swimmingly. And somebody said, you know, why did you expand? Why did you, you know, you haven't got a middle management. You should do this. And I always say, never listen to other people. Always go with your gut feel. Your gut knows. And so we listened to other people. So we went into Peter Marisburg and we bought a going concern. It was an elderly man, he had three sons, and he said, Listen, you know, um, I've got no illusions about my sons, you know, they'll never take over my business. I think you're the right people. And we at that time we had two million rand. This was nineteen eighty eight, we had two million rand in our bank account, which was to us was a fortune. So it had taken us ten years to get there. And so we went and we brought this going concern and I said to him, How much do you want for it? He said, I want two million rand. I thought, Well that's made in heaven, you know, that's gotta be. So the minute I signed on the dotted line and handed over my two million rand, he released three million rand of the checks. So he'd shown them as paid, but he hadn't released them. So I went from having two million rand in the bank to three million rand in overdraft in one afternoon. Now I tell you that at some stage when you go in your business, somebody's going to pull the rug from underneath you. And you're going to say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? But we were a cross-cultural marriage, so we couldn't fall back on our people. We had no one to go, nowhere to go to. We just had to pick up the pieces and pick ourselves up and work 10 times as hard. Mm -hmm. And we actually made that money back in two years that it had taken us. So, you know, if you've done it once, you can do it again. And at some stage in your life, the rig will be pulled out. You can't give up. You've just got to carry on. Yeah. And then now the hashes is an over 22. Um, yeah. There's over 22 stores yeah. countrywide. Mm -hmm. And you're growing. Yes. Any... Do you maybe want to expand outside of Africa, perhaps? Well, I'm passionately South African. And I always say to entrepreneurs who come to, to see me, you know, they want to make money, but I'm going to help this one and that one. You know, help yourself first. I always say to them, help yourself, make yourself rich first, because people are not going to follow you if you haven't got the money in the bank. If you don't know how to do it, they're not going to follow you. I mean, like our bodybuilder lady here, she looks magnificent. Okay. I would follow her because I would want a body like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah, but, I wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, you, you've got to be able to prove it. You've got to be able to walk your talk. So you've got to make it yourself first before you can go helping everybody else. So even on the airplane, they say, if something happens, put your own gas mask on, then help other people. So you've got to help. You've got to, you've got to make it yourself first. Then you can go around helping other people. And I'm very fortunate now that I have enough. My son has taken over my business, so he runs my business on a daily basis. 
Um, he, he's on the board of other companies out of South Africa, so he's on the board of, uh, in Mauritius and, and places like that. Personally, I'm passionately South African, absolutely passionately South African, and my goal is to build South Africans up, and that's why I work in the schools. Yesterday, I was at Mutler's school, which is um, a big school right outside of Joburg, by the Cradle of Humankind, and we gave out 500 uh, lots of sanitary packs to the girls, and I now work with the boys who do quick picks, which is pain and circumcision, and we talk to the boys about their health as well, because we've been a lot of time focusing on women. What about the guys? Yeah. Well, these girls, they maybe some come out the sky, you know. They know where they came from. So we've got to educate both sides of the point. So yes. we've got to educate our boy child as well, which we spend a lot of time educating the girl child. Why haven't you educated the boy child? Yeah. Who taught them to be gentlemen? Who taught them to be nice and kind to us? Mm -hmm. So I think that's what women, as we must do, we must start educating the boy child to behave how we would like them to behave. Interesting. Any questions? <laughs> Yes, this is the communicator. What's so the connector? Oh, you're not allowed. Okay. Right at the very back there. Can we give him uh, a microphone? Uh, <laughs> just shout. Okay, all right. Okay, please. Um, I've known about hash years and I've purchased that. But I might just confess one thing. I've always loved it with the hair. I want to see hair actually yeah. around. Uh, so, my question comes back to how you've kept everything around family. So your business is 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 is, is, is family centered. How you manage to keep it uh, family controlled? And when the, when I I would imagine that uh, there will be so many other uh, investors who are looking at taking over, uh, getting out of the business because we've already got a working model. So what has kept what has made you keep this business okay. uh, like your legacy? Okay, so it's, it's passion. Passion keeps us, you know, we've been offered huge amounts of money by huge conglomerates to, to sell out. But you know, um, in 1994, those of you who are old enough to remember 1994, uh, you know, this country was in turmoil and we didn't know what was going to happen. So what we did is we took all our delivery trucks and we sold them to our drivers and I taught the wives QuickBooks. We took all our buckies that were, were you know, we have um, men who fix fridges and stoves and washing machines and televisions. I mean, they had buckies that would come to your house and fix your washing machine. We sold them their buckies and we set them up in business. We have DSTV installers, air conditioning installers, air conditioning with payment. We have a myriad of, of little companies that we set up. I taught all the wives quick books. Why do you think I did that? So the wife does the books, the husband ain't going nowhere. <laughs> okay. So, and I'm very pleased to tell you that in a country where the divorce rate is now over 70%, all those businesses that I set up are all not only in business, but they're all married to each other to this day. Aww. Because the wives keep the money and the wives keep the books. So let that be a lesson. So, <laughs> are you answered? <laughs> oh, and so how do I keep it in the family? Um, I'm the matriarch. I'm like the big elephant, you know, the mother elephant who keeps everybody in line. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my my son is in the business. His wife isn't. She and my son married quite late in life, so he's got little children. So his wife looks after them. And then my daughter, her husband's in the medical field, so he has a, his own practice. So he's not involved in our business. So she's involved. But our family is very strong because my, my daughter-in-law's parents have been married for 47 years. My son-in-law's parents have been married for 46 years. And Anne and I have been married for 45 years. So I think that's a very strong basis to build our family. And we've got five little boys coming through the ranks, aged from 2 to 8, to 10 actually. So we've got five boys coming up through the ranks. And we are training them from now to be entrepreneurs, to, to be able to think and to be able to think, to be able to take over one day. Wow, wow. that is so amazing. <laughs> Somebody else, any question? <coughs> the gentleman at the back. Um, having tried to grow a few companies myself, I especially noticed that a lot of mentors, a lot of people say, oh, just grow your business over time, just, you know, put in the hard work, all that. But where, how did, how did you figure out what to focus your time on, who to focus your time on, and who to approach to focus that time to actually build the problem? Okay, you focus on one thing and one thing only, your customer. If your customer is happy, everybody's happy. The other thing I find a lot of people, you start talking about a business, the first thing they want is give you investors and lend you money. Now that's absolutely fantastic, but what happens is as soon as you start making money, what have you got to do? to pay them all back but you don't have to pay them back you've got to give them interest as well mm -hmm. so you start earning the money and you want to go out and buy that bmw and that nice house and all those things 
But you've got to give all the money back to the people who lent it to you. So you don't have that, it, it just doesn't gel. You know, like when we had the trouble with the miners and they, they didn't want to dig the, mine, the gold out anymore. We just showed them, they said, we're not digging the gold out because we've just got to put it to bars and put it back under the ground again. We had to show them the other things, the nice things that you made out of the gold and that. So you've got to think ahead. You don't want to go borrowing the money because you borrow, you've got to pay it back. And if you've got to pay it back, there's nothing left for you. So how daft is that? So you've got to say, I will make a little bit of money and plow back into this, make a little bit more and plow back into this, but I'm not going to borrow money from every man and his dog, because at the end I've got to pay it all back, and that's not a happy situation. I totally agree. I totally agree with you on that. And then now, let's talk about brand um, association, because with hashes you work with a lot of big brands, mm -hmm. and some of those, I mean, I couldn't mention them, but yeah. how do you build relationships with them, and how do you retain that relationship to a point where... They are there consistent, consistently. And it gets even more difficult because a lot of the big companies, um, their MDs come out from Korea, from Turkey, from all over, the, over you know, Germany, and they only have for two years. So you just build up a relationship, oops, and they go back and you get the next guy coming and you go build up a relationship. So it's really quite tough in this country. But um, uh, uh, my husband is a very nice man, and everybody likes him. They don't always like me, but they always <laughs> like him. So, uh, so um, he's very nice, and people get on very well with him. And he builds up that, that rapport with our suppliers. And we found over the years that we have built up a fantastic relationship with our suppliers. And it's so important. Your suppliers can make or break you in any industry. And there's a guy who owns Phoenix Cash and Carrie Peter Marisburg. He's a general dealer. And at one stage, there was no rust in, in um, Peter Marisburg. Now, Peter Marisburg, you know, has got like a 99% Indian population. And they eat rice. <laughs> and there was no rice. And he was the only store who had rice. I said, how did you get it right? How have you got rice? He said, because I looked after my suppliers and I used to buy his wife chocolates and take them on holidays and do things for them. And he said, when there was no rice around, that one lot of rice that came in, I got it. And that was a good lesson to me. Look after your suppliers. They can make or break you. Sometimes your suppliers, I mean, they're selling to you, their customers. Sometimes you want to be a bit ugly to them. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, we treat our suppliers like gold because mm -hmm. they can make or break us. And we we have dinner with them and we pay for the dinner. And yeah, we look after them well. And then with your, with, with your suppliers and um, the brands that you work with, are they all this, because I mean, you walk into Hershey's, it's like, Top range, like you know, like it's only classy. The best. It's only the best. Mm -hmm. So one might wonder if they're just starting out and they want to work with you or they want to work with hashes and they feel like they can actually um, create a relationship that will, you know, become something. Mm -hmm. um, do you open your arms for entry level suppliers? Uh, yes and no, and uh, we have to. We've got a reputation to withhold, uphold. So um, we we've, we've got to know that they can. Um, they can supply us ongoing. They can fix the things that they sell. They don't mean all the stuff I, um, that I sell, I have to fix as well. Um, so yes, I mean, they're like we sell beds. So there's new bedding suppliers come through. I still have the good beds, but some people want the cheaper beds. So I will go in with a local supplier who manufactures, and I'll say this is an entry level bed, but we do have the better one. And then I explain to them why they should buy a better bed. You know, because if you work out, I'm 66 years old. If I had slept for eight hours a night, I would have been asleep for 22 years. Mm. I was spent 22 years in my bed. I don't want to have a crappy bed. You know, I want to have a really good quality one. <laughs> so, you know, you say thanks to them like that, you know, and I would say, how much did you spend on your motor car? And they said, oh, I spent a million rand. How long did you spend it? Oh, about half an hour to work half an hour back every day. What did you spend on your bed? Oh, I spent two grand on that. How long did you spend on your bed? Well, eight hours a night. Well, how dark do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Mrs. Hirsch, um, as an entrepreneurial mentor, mm -hmm. how do you, do you sometimes find that there are some people that you are mentoring that are not, as we call it in the coaching fraternity, mm -hmm. uncoachable? Mm -hmm. And what do you do to draw that person back? Do you start in changing the mindset? Do mm -hmm. you go through a different method of dealing with that individual person? Mm -hmm. And also, how do you identify if that person has got an entrepreneur and or says an, an entrepreneurial bone? I can tell straight away, you know, it's like anything else. If you do it often enough, you can pick it up like that. So it's mainly, you know, the biggest, the worst disease in the world is not cancer, it's not AIDS, it's laziness. If I have a lazy person, they're never going to make it. Okay. There's also discipline. Discipline is the most important thing. 
if a person's disciplined, they'll come to work on time, they'll be at work every day, and then, then I can work with them. The minute they start coming back and calling and sick, I don't need to waste my time. No, I'm out of there. So um, I only have limited time, and I pick the people who are going to put the most effort in. I put the people in. I have a young chap called Lungli, who at the moment who is in Durban, and I, he came to me. He said, "Mentor me." He has no parents, and uh, somebody's paid for his education. He said, "Mentor me," and I mentor him. I said, "But you've got to work my hours." I get up at four o'clock in the morning. I meditate. I leave go to I leave quarter to five. Go to gym. I gym till six. Okay, I come back, I shower, I change, I'm at my desk at 7, I work with my staff and my customers till half past 5, 6 at night, I shower, I change, I have dinner with my suppliers, um, or, or I cut things like this, or, and then I go home, I do my emails, I do a thousand emails a day, so I work from about 10 to 12 on my emails, I'm studying, I'm doing business law and economics at the moment, I study till 2 o'clock, I sleep till 4 and I get up again. There's no time, to, and if you can keep up with me, then you can work with me, but if you can't, then waste my time. As a follow-up to that, I sort of heard a whole lot of oohs and ahs uh, <laughs> running through that schedule. How do you maintain that schedule? Do you have it on a uh, sort of routine basis? I have a wonderful thing called Faye. She's my PA. She does my diary, mm -hmm. which is hectic. Because I work Monday, Tuesday, Joe, Wednesday, Thursday, Cape Town, Friday, Saturday, Jeremy, Friday, and Sunday on my farm. So um, I move all the time. I'm on a plane almost every second night. And uh, yeah, and then I work one week of the month out of the country because I work with Lionesses of Africa. And uh, Melanie Hawken is fantastic. She has over 300,000 entrepreneurs in Africa on her books. So when she went to Rwanda, she took me there. Um, and yeah, we work with entrepreneurs around uh, the continent, but I'm, I'm mainly focused on South Africa. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, up there. Um, I'd like to find out from you, based upon what your business does, obviously you've got you know, a lot of interaction between yourself, the client, and the service provider, so to speak. Um, in your opinion, what would be the best way to handle a, a dispute, for example, whereby a, a client might have an issue with the work that a provider might have done? Do you a, step in um, on the side of the client, um, bring on the service provider, or taking into consideration that that provider does a lot of work for you, do you, you know, fall more onto the side of the service provider themselves? You know, you always have to do what's right, and sometimes it's not always the right thing, but you've got to do what's right. So, um, you know, I, we have to, everything is different. I've got a case at the moment where my a guy went to the chap had an old fridge, and he had to fix, you know that switch on the door that switches the light on and off when you open it? And he, as he put his screwdriver in, it cracked the, the inner lining, but when I tell you that much, and this guy wants a whole new fridge, and he's really been pathetic mm -hmm. about it. And of course, the social media today, you know, they love it. They mm -hmm. it all over the show. And, and so my guy went, he said, look, I can fix it. And he tried to fix it. The guy said, I don't like the way he's fixed it. He's made a mess of it. I don't want this. So it's really difficult, and you've got to take each one. And, but you know what? Over the internet, people are very cheeky. On social media, they're very cheeky. But when you sit them down face to face, and you say, look, your fridge was old. We had to fix it. It's working fine now. I don't think this is a major issue. Um, yeah, but what can we do? And I always ask the client what he wants because you've got, your customer is the most important person, so number, he's number one. And then what does he want? And, and can we do this? Sometimes they ask for the impossible. You can't do it. But if you can possibly do it, then we do what we can. And everyone is in negotiation. There's no, there's, I teach what you don't learn in Harvard Business School. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I'm sort of curious as to why you're such a strong mentor to female entrepreneurs. Is it something like what's the genesis of that? Did you have a strong female uh, mentor when you were growing up? Was it the lack of it that made you want to? to Probably. Well, I always say my mother was, was my control because she did all the all the things she did. I thought I'm never going to do. And, and you take something like Peggy Sue Kamala who came through the ranks, and she came to, to Johannesburg. Her mother was a domestic worker at Springs. And she came, and she worked for two years as a domestic worker with her mother. And one day she looked up, and she saw her mother, and she said, oh my gosh, I don't want to be there in 20 years' time. And that's when she went, she got a job, same as me washing hair in a hairdressing salon, from where she then became, she was so pretty, they said, um, you know, they had this elements competition, she entered that, when she won, and that's when she went on to win the South Africa. 
And those of you who don't know, the night she went to South Africa, um, her, her mother said to her, Madam, can I please go and watch my daughter? She's in the fountains of South Africa. And she said, like, actually, you can't. You need to be here. And then, so when she went to her room, Peggy's boyfriend took her and drove her to Mendon where she was in the finals of South Africa. And as she walked in in her ball dress, she looked at her mother and she was in her little pink and white three-piece overall. And she said, Mom, I'm doing this for you so that other people don't have to go through what you've been through. And she won. And um, Madiba took her, um, she had her the year of her reign. Her mother, who's a domestic worker from Springs, had to go to India on her own to see her daughter in the Miss Universe competition, which she did. And then Madiba said to her, he said to her when her reign was over, he said, what do you want? And she said, if I had one wish, I'd go to university. So he sent her to the University of Manchester, where she spent for three years with a standard grade um, trip from, from Newcastle Hills High, and she, from there, she got straight A's, economics and political science. I'm doing economics, how she got straight A's, I'll never know. <laughs> uh, and, she, and then she came back and he sent her back to do her master's. And, you know, for me, it's just stories like that, that was empowers me to, to help other women. Because Peggy Sue, as you know, is now one of the top women at the University of Colorado, Senator. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. So, um, you know, and when you see what people like she has done, you just think, wow, let us help these other women to come up through the ranks. I forgot, have I answered your question? My question was, what was the genesis of that? Oh, yes. Yeah, so my mother taught me what I shouldn't do. Right, right. And now I, I know what I should do. Right. So I just do that. And yeah, my, what my mentor was actually a man by the name of Bob Records who taught me uh, what he'd taken 40 years to learn. He taught me in two years. And that's why that's the power of mentorship. And that's why I mentor others, you know, so that um, they can go on and, and mentor others as well. Amazing. Yeah. Any questions? Will you mentor me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I, I just want to ask about the evolution of wishes. Um, right now, I'm not sure what sort of work you guys are doing in e-retail. It only accounts for about 1% in retail in South Africa, but it is significant in terms of the change in generations as well. So, what sort of trajectory are you guys planning in terms of becoming an e-commerce you know, provider or you know, adapting your model of business onto the e-commerce platforms and yeah, what is the future of your business? Yeah, we're working a lot at the moment. We were so lucky to be a finalist in the EY competition as well. And we went over, and one of the things we wanted to learn about was robotics and how it's going to help our business. Because what we're working on at the moment is a, a system where you take your cell phone, and as you walk in, you know like you swipe your, the oyster when you go from the London Underground, you actually swipe your cell phone and will upload all your details into our database. And then whatever you see in our shop, you just swipe, swipe your cell phone across it. And at the end, when you walk out the shop, it'll just say collect or deliver, and everything's done seamlessly. So that's what the model we work on at the moment. On e-commerce, our e-commerce is growing in leaps and bounds, but it's still a very small portion. Because South Africans will research. 70% of everybody who comes into our shop to buy has researched what they're going to buy online first. <laughs> They've all had a look. They know it. They've studied it. They'll come in and they'll say, tell me about your TV. <laughs> 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 So they'll come in and we have to know, and that's why we train our staff all the time. We train every single day from 8 to 8.30 on, on general stuff and the trends of what's new and hip-hop and happening. But then every day we train our staff as well. So on e-commerce, it's just growing. We're literally employing, I'd say, two people a month. Um, and it was only when I saw Take A Lot have 100 um, software engineers on their books, I thought, wow, we better move it up. We've got like five. <laughs> you know, so, but with a lot of things, we do a lot ourselves. You know, when I spoke to the, the Society of Chartered Accountants, they said, how many chartered accountants do you employ? And I said, none. They said, why not? I said, I don't have to pay a guy 70 grand a month to tell me I've got money. I look in the bank. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you got to keep it simple. If you got money, you're okay. If you haven't, you're in PSG, you have to work that much harder. Uh -huh. And it's interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> I've also read that you are like fully involved. You are like hands on on literally every element of your business. Do you have to do that? I mean, well, if, you're if, you, if you were turning two billion a year, what would you do? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't sit down and somebody else watch it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's talk about Michael Mahesh's Women of the Year Awards. Yes. Why? Why did you start that? Okay, so who is it for actually? Um, it's for anybody who's an entrepreneur and anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur. So what we do is we start with my ladies group that we have in all the stores once a month. So we meet once a month and we bring our business owners and even people who want to get in. You know, I always say to people, and I'll tell you as well, you can work for a boss and make a living, you can work for yourself and make a fortune. Why would you do the first when you can do the second? You know, why would you? I mean, it's crazy. Yes. So I find a lot of people today, and even if you heard uh, the last speaker last night, she says she's got a position in government, but she's got a sideline, she's an entrepreneur on the side as well. I thought, wow, yeah, she's out there saying it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, I think, and I always say to all my entrepreneurs, get your idea, start working it, and when you can earn more as an entrepreneur than you're earning as a salary, then give up the salary. And that's how you do it. But we take the ideas, when people come to us in corporate with ideas, and we give you the action you have to take to, to get there. Now, the one my winner, who was my October winner in four ways last year, um, now has just sold out, and I can say to Liberty, for a, a huge sum of money. And they've employed her for two years to teach their staff how to run. And she, her business was actually an advertising business, but I always make them do something to give back to the community as well. And her business to give back is called Money Saving Kids. And she sold that out to them, so that now she's teaching their staff how to run money savvy kids. So, you know, um, there's an old saying, you can count the pips in an orange, but you can't count the oranges in a pip. You never know when you start something how far it's going to go and what the ramifications are. So that's what we do. And every little bit of good you do, when you plant that seed, you don't know. It might fall on the rocky ground, not grow. It might fall and just grow up forever. But when you get those big eaves of corn coming, and we've had such successes at Hershey's with our entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. And then the the process of of, of taking um, of entering the competition and having to choose winners. Who, who, who do you look for? Like, what do you look for? I, I look for something unusual. I look for that spark. I look for that extra something that that somebody's got. So we have so every month in every branch we choose a winner, and then from the, the end, networking from, events. from the networking events. Okay. And then at the end of the year we have our gala dinner where we choose the winners from the top. Now, Avina Govind, who was my winner in Durban last year, is now in Seattle representing South Africa for IWIC, which is International Women Entrepreneurs Conference. So, and, you know, from there we're growing these women up. She would never have had the opportunity before. She was just working in her own business from home. Mm -hmm. And so we started growing her up, and she grew up. And, and, and with that, she's taken a lot of entrepreneurs up with her as well. Hmm, interesting. And then now, um, the family aspect of it. Mm. How do you make sure that you keep your family together? Because, I mean, I seen your pictures. Of, not that I was stalking you. <laughs> Very yeah. good Instagram account, I must say. Um, you always pride yourself about family. Family this, family that, which we don't mind, you know. Yeah. How do you put your family together, how do you keep them together and in such a way that it looks almost like it's perfect yeah. and it's, it might be hard or difficult for somebody, especially in your caliber, yeah. to have time for family, to, 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 to talk a lot about their families and to attend the family gatherings and stuff like that, and yet you are running a multi-millionaire company. How do you balance the two? I think you've got to take time, you know, it takes planning. And there's a song that you must Google, it's called I've Got a Millionaire Mind, and, and Google it, it's a lovely song, it's a lovely thing to, and you have to, it all starts in your mind, so you've got to become a millionaire in your mind first. And then with my family, um, I, I work with, with my staff, and with, with and it's a family business, so my daughter works in the business, she does our branding and advertising and that, you've heard our, our music mm -hmm. um, And that just came, because we, we mean, we weren't going to pay a voiceover artist, we were sitting around the table, they said we should have this, uh, this advert, and we should say hi, uh, you know, something about Hershey's, and they, we looked, my daughter was sitting there, well, you're not busy right now, you go record. That's how it happened, you know. You don't have to have put a lot of thought in it. But, um, so, yeah, I think uh, we work very hard, we work in the family. I handed over to my son in 2000, so he's been running at that side for 17 years as well. And my kids grew up in the business, so they understand the business, they know business as well. But Sundays are our day where we all get together, because we all work all over the country, and Sundays we all come together as a unit. We have lunch together, we all cook, so we all cook, and so we're going to give away some cookbooks at the end of this. So um, we all cook a lot, and we all eat a lot, and we just work together. So Sundays are our day, but whenever we can get, if I'm, and say I'm in Durban, my, my grandsons will go to school in Durban, I will go and I will choose one, and I'll pick that one up this time, and the next one, the next time, I have to get it very even. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and I'll pick them up from school, and I'll spend time with them. And they, they see what we do, you know, and children, I always say children will not do as you say, 
that you see what you do and then what's going to be led you. And with um, the pictures, I teach women to bake, and I, te I take women out the townships with zero education, and I teach them to bake and how to make a living from baking. And to me, the best thing is when they have their graduation at the end of the month, they, they bring their children. I make them bring their children. And I've got such a gorgeous picture of a little boy taking a picture of his mother's cakes. And I saw his work ethic. His mother was lying at home doing nothing. We brought her, we taught her to bake, and she just blossomed and grew. And her child saw this happening, and he now has got such a good work ethic that he can't wait to get to work. Yeah. Interesting. Any questions before we wrap up? Um, you've been raising up your hand, lady. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I almost gave up. My name is Julia, and you are both like. I'm yeah. so level to be for the <laughs> and I'm wondering because they, they used to say five years, the five first years of the business tells you whether it's going to survive or not. How was your five years? It was very hard work, you know, I, I worked in a shop, my husband worked did the repairs and I worked in the shop. I don't think people would be nice to you, you know. My husband would go and he was the repairman, so he'd knock on the front door and I'll give you a particular instance. This woman phones up, she said, you fixed my fridge last week and everything's broken again, get yourself here at 7 o'clock in the morning, this is like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so he dropped the kids at school, he drops me at work, he goes, he knocks on the front door and she said, Tim, what are you doing here? Get around to the back door, you're a servant, use the service bridges. He had to take his toolbox and walk around, knock on the back door. The rest of the group comes to the door and she says, Oh, she says, the man doesn't want you here when she's here. Just sit there and wait. And it was February in Durban, it was so hot. He sat in his toolbox and waited. And at 9 o'clock, he saw the Mercedes driving up the driveway and he knocks the door and says to Mr. Griffin, What happened? She said, The man didn't want you in the house when she's here. Now she's gone, you can come in. And he went in, and all that happened is she, she'd been doing the ironing. She pulled the, the plug out for the fridge and she forgot to put it back. So there was nothing wrong with the fridge. We never got a, a pay for that job. And that's what we had to go through. Same customer, he's got four daughters, still got me today. And um, <laughs> he, the eldest one was getting married and he decided to buy her a dishwasher. And he came in and came and negotiated the price. When he came with the money, he took the clips off the notes and he threw them on the floor and he says, pick that up. And I looked at little Jay Sucros, she still works with me today. And she said, Mrs. Hirsch, we've both got children to feed. Let's get on our hands and knees, I'll help you. We've got on our hands and knees, we picked the money up. Sometimes you've got to do what you don't want to do to get the job done. Sometimes you've got to do things that go against your grave, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do to get the job done, because today, those people are nowhere, and I'm somewhere. go with your gut feel a lot of times, but a lot of times I'm a very trusted person. I trust everybody, you know. And you can understand, I mean, I've got a lot of stock in my shops. In a normal shop, they probably between 100 and 200 million of the stock in the store. So I have to trust people. Um, I have a philosophy that 10% of all people are honest, and 10% of all people are dishonest. And 80% will be dishonest if they can get away with it. <laughs> so you've got to put them into those boxes, and you've got to understand where they are. So you, obviously you try and eliminate the dishonest ones as quickly as you can, and it's very easy. Very easy, you know. I'll give you a instance. When I'm interviewing, I'm sitting at my laptops at my desk in front of me, and I put a hundred rand notes under the laptop, and I leave it sticking out that much. <laughs> and I get up and I say, I'm just going somewhere, I'll be back in a minute. Ooh. Now, about 40% of people will take it. Okay? 10% um, will say, you know there's a hundred rand up there, and other people can't take their eyes off it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 things like that, that tells you a lot about the person. So there's lots of things, and I ask them uh, random questions, because you know there's no such thing as business ethics, you are what you are, what you are at home is what you are at work. Mm -hmm. So if they say, oh my god, you know, every weekend I'm partying and drinking and carrying on, that's not the type of person I want in my business. You know, I want a good family man, I want a person who's going to work hard, who's got a bond to pay, who's got a car payment, who's got school fees to pay. That's my type of person. And they, I know that they'll work hard and that they, they will not jeopardize their job for the sake of a few bob. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy one, it's probably the hardest thing, but I trust everybody until they give me reason not to trust them. Absolutely. One last question. <laughs> Finally, yeah. Um, my name is Solomon. Um, I've been struggling a little bit with uh, understanding the concept of partnership. Um, I've been reading and read about um, Raymond Kumar who said that partnering with you know, other people uh, it will actually help your business grow. 
And in my business, I'm, I'm struggling to find out, actually to identify the kind of business that I want that would actually fit, be able to fit for my business to grow because I'm, I'm, I'm a small business, but I, I, I got a, you know, a billionaire in mind. Yeah. And therefore, I, I'd like to see my business in, in the next five years grown to, you know, um, possibly 100, 200 employees. Yeah. Okay, it, it's a difficult one. You're asking me, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is don't get a partner, do it by yourself, because at least if you have a partner, you have to give half of all you make to him. And it's <laughs> you know, I'm a hard worker, so I don't want a partner, because if I were a partner with somebody else, and they're not going to work as hard as me, I'm not going to be a happy chappy. And when I make that money, I'm going to give half to nobody. You know? So my advice to everyone is do it yourself. Do it yourself, because then you've got the fulfillment of knowing you've done yourself. You can't blame anybody. That's you know, it's lovely to be able to blame on your fault. You know, but you've got. I make all my stuff every morning. They point to themselves and they say, "If it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me." And if you take that philosophy and know that you can do it, you know, when God put you on this earth, He put the seed of greatness inside you. It's up to you to grow it. He gave you a gift, and your your mission, your purpose in life is to find your gift. Your mission in life is to give it away. I was so lucky I found my gift, I, I've, and my gift is that I see everybody not as they are, but as they can be. Now I want to ask each one of you, if you could have done more with your life up to now, could you have? I said, of course. Well, why didn't you? What was fear? Yeah. What was what's holding you back? And what is fear? Fear is false evidence appearing real. You think you can't do it. If you thought you could do it by yourself and you wouldn't fail, would you do it? Of course, of course you would. So why on earth would you want to drag somebody behind you you've got to give half your money to? At the end of the day. Now that's daft. <laughs> that was very insightful and I wish we could carry on the entire evening. It was very good. Just to wrap up, um, for somebody who feel that they're stuck or um, this whole entrepreneurial thing is not working out, but they know they want to be entrepreneurs, they know they want to build multi-million companies. What advice would you say to that person? You know, there's no magic formula. The, the only thing you can do is work. First of all, you have to have your goal. You've got to know. You know, I would say, when you did a puzzle as a child, what would you do first? You get all the straight bits and you put them out and it's easy to fill the middle. What you, so those are your goals. That then you, if you know what your goals are, you know what you're aiming at. The next thing is you've got to be specific in what you want. You can't just be airy-fairy. You know, if you or call the Uber, you don't get in and just sit there and wait for him to tell you where he's going to go. <laughs> but in your life, how often in your life do you just get in and say, well, this is life, where are you going to take me? You know. Yeah. So you have to do, when you get into any situation, you've got to know exactly where you go. You've got to know exactly what you want out of that whole thing. And if you know what you want, you always get it. You know, it says in the Bible, it says, you know, ask and to be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and those doors will be opened. It doesn't say anyway, sit on your jacket and hope it's going to fall into your lap. Don't say that. So you've got to understand that you've got to work incredibly hard. You have to work, you have to have discipline. And discipline is doing what you don't feel like doing. You've got to just carry on and do it. And then thirdly, you've got to be consistent. You've got to keep going. You know, the secret of our success is that I'm now not only um, selling to the, the, the children of the people I started with, I'm selling to their grandchildren. They came in as little children and they know that their mother trusted me, that she would ask me her advice, I'd give her the correct advice, and they come back to me. You have to be consistent, you have to keep going. People want to get rich overnight and you're going to sit and do nothing. You know, you can't do that. No. It doesn't, that's not how it works. So you, you've got to understand, first of all, it's not a destination, it's a journey. It's a journey that your whole life is on. And that you have to know where you're going. And if you start with the end in mind and you work backwards, and when I go to the schools, I make them write an essay which says, I'm 90 years old sitting on my front porch looking back on my life. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened when I was 89, 88, mm -hmm. and, it, and it all finished, and the, the last line says, and it started, um, when Mrs. Hirsch spoke to me at Mutlet um, Girls High School on whatever date it was. That's how wow. the essay finishes. Yeah. Now, when you've written that essay, and any one of you could do it, you could write that essay backwards. And it has to be backwards. If you, you'll try and start writing it forwards. No, it's like climbing up a ladder, you'll fall off. It was easier to come backwards down the ladder. It's much easier than climbing up. So you come backwards down that ladder. And when you've written that essay about your life, you've actually written the steps that you have to take to get to where you want to be. That's how easy it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.